Um, so welcome to today's webinar, learning to use the Dimensions database. This is um, the first time we've run a, a training on this particular tool accessible to the BU you know, population at large through the Office of Research. Um, I think there were at least a few years ago, some trainings that perhaps the library did, but um, this is kind of the first time for this version of the training. Uh, my name is Joe Farmer. I am a program manager and data analyst in the Office of Research, uh, reporting up to Gloria Waters. Um, some of you may recognize me from the SciVal webinars and trainings that we run every semester as well. Um, if you're interested and haven't heard about those, it's another bibliometric, bibliometric platform online that we have access to for the general BU population um, that is another wonderful resource. So just a few notes on what we'll do today. Um, basically today we're going to look at using the, um, the dimensions platform and what information it has, what the kind of the basics of that data source are and some notes on how to use it, cautions, things like that. Um, we'll have about one hour of content in the webinar that will involve um, just background and kind of those things I mentioned as well as a few example exercises just some kind of question prompts that I've written that are not necessarily super in-depth tasks, but things that will just kind of help you practice some of the things and skills that I talk about as we go through. Um, after the content, we will have some time for question and answer at the end. Um, with any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat as I go through. I will do my best to answer any questions I can in real time. Um, if I can't answer it in real time, we will take a break about halfway through just for a couple minutes um, and I can catch up on questions then. Um, just a few notes. Um, please, please, please make sure to remain muted. There are 50 some people in here. Um, video, it's, I have video off on there. If you really wanna keep your video on, doesn't bother me, um, but there is no need to keep your video on. Um, so please muted, video is kind of up to you. Um, questions through the chat. Just as one last side note before we start diving in here, if there are major tech issues, if um, you know for some reason the webinar crashes, the internet's going out, you know whatever major issue there is, please just keep an eye on your email. We have the ability to quickly uh, send out you know email communication to everyone who's been in the room. So if there is some sort of major tech issue, that is how we will communicate how we are restarting, what's happening, that sort of thing. So without further ado, we shall jump into it. <clears throat> so first off this slide, um, if you haven't already done so, like I mentioned kind of right at the top of the hour, um, everybody at BU has access to dimensions. Um, here are some basic instructions uh, to access dimensions and create your own account. Um, if you want to, to kind of follow along in real time, play with it as I'm guiding you and do the sort of training exercises that I've provided, um, this is how you go about making your account. Please note, as with SciVal, we can only support your bu.edu email address. Um, that is all that works in our subscription. So you cannot use a personal email, your Gmail account, Yahoo, anything of that sort. It has to be your BU subscription and it will involve using your BU Kerberos um, as part of the login process. <clears throat> so as we kind of get started here, what is Dimensions? Um, Dimensions is an online bibliometric platform that is managed by digital science. Um, they have a variety of tools um, that they provide and, and kind of manage. This is just one of those. The real cool thing about dimensions compared to other databases we have access to and other databases in the world at large is that it contains a more robust set of different item types. Um, you know, those of you that have, have played around in SciVal or have been to those webinars that I run, um, I, I will kind of be comparing and making some contrasts with SciVal as we go through here on their relative strengths and weaknesses. A platform like SciVal is very limited to publications. It has lots of different types of publications, but it's primarily just publications. 
uh, dimensions has a much more well-rounded set of things. It has publications, but also data sets, uh, more robust grant data, patent information, links to clinical trials, and links to policy documents. So it's a little more, more varied of an item type, which can allow for some more interesting and different analyses and, and you know, bits of information to be gleaned from the system. As with SciVal, it is a item kind of publication in SciVal item and dimensions based database. Um, again, that's just kind of one of those things. It, it is what it is. It has its strengths and weaknesses. Um, it is not based on a person. It is based on the publications and built from there. What that does is allow a lot of the kind of bibliometric type things to be easily accessible. It makes it difficult because there's not necessarily departmental information and things baked into it. You can filter by search, you can filter or by institution, you can search by and filter by people and things like that. But it's just kind of important to keep in mind that the, the fundamental kernel of data is the publication. Um, good question came in via the chat. Um, will the Zoom be recording be available to us later? I forgot to mention that on my initial notes, so thank you for bringing that up. Yes, the um, the recording and the slides will be made available later. It takes us a couple days to get everything processed and posted on the website, um, but stay tuned uh, to your email, um, whatever email you used to register for this webinar. Um, and in a few days, as soon as we have the recording and the slides posted on the research website, I will email that link out. <clears throat> so um, to just kind of wrap up before I move on from this slide, one thing to keep in mind is any online source of funding information is not necessarily comprehensive. Um, Dimensions, this is the same problem with SciVal, with any of these online sources, is that they are limited by what information they can get. Things that are publicly available, usually the big kind of federal funding sources, are typically pretty well indexed on these sites. What's not so well indexed are industry gifts, uh, foundation funding, private sources, things like that, where there's not necessarily an easily accessible public record of the grant, of the gift, of whatever type of funding it was. So just kind of keep that in mind that this is an interesting tool in that it can link um, more directly to funding data and like look at, say, what funding sources went into a publication. But that shouldn't be taken as the end all be all, you know, perfect view of a funding source. It's more just one potential use Dimensions has that other platforms don't necessarily match. <clears throat> um, dimensions is a very, very kind of large and robust data source in terms of the count of items. Um, they draw in data from as many publishers and public data sources as they possibly can um, and are constantly working to expand that. At this point, um, the Dimensions database has about 124 million publications indexed, in addition to policy documents, data sets, clinical trials, things of that nature. Um, so it's a very, very big database. Um, they also pull in information from existing kind of other search functions and databases. Um, you know, PubMed, as an example, a lot of people are familiar with using PubMed to find publications, to find information about, you know, whatever research topic they're working on. Um, in Dimensions, you can filter by PubMed publications. And what that lets you do is look at only publications that would show up in a PubMed search. Um, so it kind of integrates as many tools like that as it can into your search functions. Um, in terms of kind of my ongoing comparisons that'll pop up here and there with SciVal, the database is actually significantly larger than that of SciVal. Um, but the difference is that SciVal is a more robust data source for current publications. SciVal, for those of you that use it, really kind of goes back to the mid 90s in terms of what it will show you through the web portal. And that's about it. Uh, dimensions, however, 
We'll go back to the 1600s, I believe, are the earliest publication items uh, that are in the Dimensions database. So you have an ability to go much, much further back in time um, in Dimensions, which may not be particularly useful for many people, but it just kind of gives a, a little compare and contrast with some other tools. Um, SciVal can't find you writings from the 1800s, from the 1700s, and sources from there dimensions potentially can. Um, so depending on what field you're in, what you're trying to do, are you trying to find primary source material, things like that, dimensions may be a strong tool for that. <clears throat> Just a couple of other notes um, before I actually start kind of moving back and forth between uh, the slides and just sort of showing you the interface itself and walking through some of the mechanics of how to use it. Um, disciplinary assignment is always a bit of a, a tricky thing in online databases, um, SciVal, Dimensions, you know, any, any online database that, that makes an attempt to do so. Dimensions in particular highlights that they do a machine learning algorithm that kind of is fed things of a known subject area and learns them and then automatically assigns the subject area. Their, their goal with that is to eliminate what comes up as a problem for many websites is that the nominal discipline of the journal or publishing entity influences the discipline of the item. Um, so you know the, the example I've given in other webinars is if you wrote an economics paper about the economics of higher education, but it was published in an education journal, the fact that the journal is flagged as an education publication will influence the disciplinary assignment of the article. Even if it's purely economics, it might get tagged with education as well. The theory here is that the machine learning algorithm isn't looking at the journal discipline as much and can better suss out what is the actual content of the article. All of this is just to say as kind of background information and also to say that there may be a little hiccup here and there um, with, with disciplinary assignment. If something pops up for you, um, for someone in a department, in a, a center, you know, whatever grouping of people you're looking at that has a slightly off kilter um, disciplinary assignment, you know, you're not expecting to be like, hey, I don't publish in that discipline. It may have to do with this kind of slight fuzziness that, that comes with trying to figure out what is the exact discipline in some cases. Two other metrics that I think are worth calling out here um, are the field citation ratio and relative citation ratio. Um, field citation ratio, very similar to a field weighted citation impact in SciVal, um, just kind of looks to norm. Um, citation performance based on um, similar discipline and publication year. Um, little different than field weighted citation impact, but very similar. Um, relative citation ratio is for PubMed publications only. Um, and instead of looking at um, the same discipline, it looks at publications cited alongside the publication in question. They're both kind of these somewhat normalized um, pub or citation metrics. They both have a lot of value. Um, some of them are very popular for funders to request on applications for grants and things of that nature. Um, while FCR is similar to a value we can get in SciVal, as far as I know off the top of my head, Dimensions is the only data source we have access to that automatically just calculates these for you. So depending on what you're applying for, if you have a funder that's requesting a, a field citation ratio or a relative citation ratio, Dimensions can be a great place to get that data very quickly. So the the big trick with dimensions, um, and there's just a couple more slides we'll go through before I start switching to the database itself to show you, is searching. 
searching is a, a the biggest hurdle to successful use of dimensions. It is simultaneously a very powerful search interface, but it can be very, very easy to kind of uh, accidentally put on too many filters or not quite searched for what you're thinking. Um, there's a lot of options. So the kind of image I cut and paste into the PowerPoint here is just showing some of the, the various options you have, funding groups, publication years, the researcher, the country, the organization. There's more to this list that we'll see when I switch to the site. There was just no way to fit it in a nice clean screenshot. Everything you can filter with in Dimensions also has the ability to be a limit filter or an exclude filter. So if I put in Boston University, I can limit it to only results that match Boston University. I can also exclude any result with Boston University. If you want to see everything except a certain subset, you can do that as well. Um, you can save searches. So if you do have a set of criteria that you're going to be using repeatedly, you know, your own work, you just want to have a standing search to be able to look at your own profile. Um, if you're going to build a department or something like that, using that custom kind of saved search can save you a lot of time. You go through the work to build it once, and then you can save it so you don't have to go through the work of building the search again. <clears throat> you can do and and or functions as well. Um, I know one question that came in on a registration form was how to do this kind of searching logic. So I wanted to make sure that that got kind of highlighted. If you take an item type in the search bar. And like I said, all this is gonna show up in a demonstration shortly. Um, so two researchers, let's say, and you select them together, that will automatically create an or function. It's looking for author A or author B. If you select things independently, not multiple at a time, but a researcher and you search, and then you add a funder to that, it creates an and function. So looking for researcher A and funder A. So all of a sudden you're getting a slightly different approach. The ability to do this with lots of item types is great. It lets you create very, very detailed searches, but it's also very, very easy, especially with an and search function to accidentally cut out a lot of things. If you accidentally make it researcher A and researcher B instead of or, all of a sudden you're gonna have a much, much smaller body of, of results. And that might be what you're after, but it's also very, very easy to accidentally put in some conflicting terms and then have no results, have two results, something like that. So one just word of advice is build your searches very slowly. And don't be afraid to delete search terms. That's a very easy thing to do as you go through searching in dimensions, is you can kind of, in real time, delete one term, add one term, and kind of edit those things as you go. So don't be afraid to kind of backtrack a little in your searching if it seems like you're not getting results that make sense. Um, question came in, can you edit the search string manually? Um, I'm not entirely sure what the question is referring to by manually. Um, you have the option, as I'll show you in just a moment, to kind of continuously change what's in there in using their interface. If the question is more referring to, to like writing code, we'll touch on the ability to use like an API or code uh, more towards the end of the webinar. Um, so if that's more what it's referring to, it's kind of a, we'll get there in a few minutes. Um, if it's neither of those options, ah, there it is. If it's neither of those options, please give me some clarification. Um, you do see the search string itself. I'm actually gonna show an example of what you will see um, that is, is kind of present um, in just on the next slide here. So let me know if your question gets answered and we will, we will take it from there if it doesn't. So this is an example of what a small search string would look like um, in the dimensions window. Um, I put in Michael Hasselmo and Christopher Chen as at the same time. 
So I, I made an or function there. I selected the two of them. I put in the National Science Foundation as a funder and Boston University as an organization. So this search would find me publications or items, as I should say more generically, that were authored by either Michael Haslamo or Christopher Chen that have NSF funding and have BU as an institutional affiliate on the authors. So if they had work from prior institutions, that wouldn't show up. It would have to have BU as an institution. It would have to have at least one of them as an author, and it would have to have funding from the NSF. <clears throat> um, last slide before I switch to showing you some of this, more than just telling you some of this, because I think there's a lot of benefit to that rather than just listening to my voice. Um, the main results window that's going to pop up is going to default to a large list of just items, one after the other with a very, very brief overview. Any of these items can then be clicked on to bring up detailed view of that item. Depending on what the item is, what data is available, you're going to be able in that detailed view to see things like a list of all the authors what references it includes and what has cited it. So both the references and the citations. Um, in some cases where possible, they will show you what grants funded a given paper. Um, there's also a link to the altmetric overview. We'll get into altmetrics more in the second half of today's webinar. So I'm actually just gonna leave this um, and we're going to jump into the website itself for a few minutes so I can kind of show you the search features and the things that I have been talking about. Uh, whoa, I have way too many windows open. There we go. Um, you should at this point be seeing dimensions. Um, as with any of these websites, it's a little bit how things are stretched or fit will will change based on how big your screen is. I'm working on my laptop screen, so it may be a little crunched. Um, but you know, if you have a big screen, it might look a little nicer. So you can see kind of the same things that um, that I've been talking about. You have over here those search functions, these various drop downs, and like I said, you know, there's more of them than fit on that PowerPoint slide. Source title, you know, if you're looking for a specific source. Um, publication type, if you're only interested in articles or chapters or something of that nature. There's also various research categories. If you look at quantifying you know, research output in a broad area, there's fields of research, health categories, all of these different designations that can go with an item. Um, journals, publishers, open access, if you're only looking for open access items, all kinds of ways to filter. Up here is where you'll see your search string being built in real time as you do so. Um, and then down here in the middle is your, um, your, your kind of updated live results list. There is a find at BU button. So if you are interested in finding an article, you can just click the find at BU button and make that nice and simple. Um, if you save any groups, they'll show up in this my groups kind of filter up here where you can save those search queries um, so you don't have to recreate them over and over. I'm going to minimize that because I don't have any saved on this uh, account. So let's go ahead and kind of build a little search term and see what happens. And like I said, those of you that decided to kind of go ahead and register, feel free to do this in real time and, and kind of see how it changes for you. So let's start with a researcher um, right here drop that down, it by default populates it with the biggest number values of your existing search. So right now it's a bunch of people I've never heard of um, because we haven't searched anything. We have to scroll down a little and hit more and that's gonna pop up a search box where you can put in somebody's name. Um, so I'm gonna start kind of showing that one that I built. If I start going, Christopher, there's going to be a ton. S. Chen, um, we can see at the top here, Christopher S. Chen, Boston University. Um, and then there's going to be a limit two option. So if I just want that, great, I can hit limit two. 
And now we see the page refreshes. I have just a search for an author and it pulls up automatically a profile of that author and the publication list. Um, just to show real quick, let's click on the second one here to see what the detailed view looks like. If I click on that article, now I have some information about where it is. I have the author list, abstract, acknowledgements, a lot of that kind of extra information that I was talking about. References, citations, it has two supporting grants um, from the National Cancer Institute and the National Institute of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering. So there's a little bit of funding information there. Um, all kinds of kind of detailed stuff about that particular piece. But let's go back and make a little more complex search. Maybe I don't want just Chris Chen. Maybe I'd like you know, to recreate that one I did earlier. Let's go to researcher. I hit the X there to get rid of that term. And let's go back to researcher and let's, let's take multiple at the same time. So we'll do the same start. But this time, instead of clicking limit to, I'm just gonna click on the name. And now you can see up here it's selected, but no action has been taken yet. I can just hit more again, and now I can start putting in another person. And if I start typing Michael Hasselmo's name in, again, you can kind of see it has Boston University there. I can click on his name, and now I have two authors selected. Like I mentioned in the PowerPoint, there's an option to limit to or exclude. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and hit limit to. Now I've created that or term. So it's looking for anything with either of those two authors. I've taken my 124 million publications down to 634 between the two of them. To add the next term in the search, just go back to your filters over here and find what's next. Let's add a search term. There's a bunch of, the again, heaviest, the biggest numbers for whatever my current search is. So right now of those 634, it's finding the most common funders. The NSF is already right here. Once again, I can just hit limit to, or if I wanna make a more complicated search, I can select multiple things. Let's just hit limit two. Now we've taken our two author search and added a funder and we're down to 40 publications. And you can just keep refining and refining as much as you need to. In the example in the PowerPoint, I added Boston University. In this case, let's add something different. Let's look at a research category. Um, let's go to fields of research. And let's say we're only looking for articles with these two funded by the NSF that are in biomedical engineering. Well, fields of research, as with any of these categories, there's a little fuzziness, but we can use their biomedical engineering field of research code, limit to that. And now we have a set of five publications that fit this search criteria. Great. Keep in mind, like I said, maybe, maybe these five publications don't hit what you want. Anytime you want, just come back up here, hit the X, and it will get rid of just that search term. So you can kind of see it develop, and now we're back to the 40. We got rid of that one filter. Once you have something set up that you like, you can hit this Save and Export button over here. Set as a favorite is going to populate it into your Favorites tab on the search where you can save your favorite searches. Um, if you export it, it's just gonna give you um, the option to export the results via a couple of different formats. So if you were trying to, to you know, get that data to use in a different, a different platform, you could do so that way. Go ahead and cancel because I don't want to do that right now. <clears throat> so that's kind of the basics of how to search. And like I said, the, the real key here is to make sure you're not afraid to go back and get rid of things. If I wanted to add a third author, I would need to edit this term. Because if I said, okay, 
I'm just going to add a third person. You're going to get very, very small numbers of publications very, very quickly. If I wanted to make it Christopher S. Chen or Michael Eric Casimo or a third author, I can't just add that third author as a separate term. Delete this term and rebuild it, and you're going to get a better set of results. So we're going to jump back to the PowerPoint very briefly. Um, at this point, we're going to take just a quick couple minute break um, so I can have a sip of water. If anybody else needs one, go for it. Um, I'm also going to put the first practice exercise up here, just how to basics of how to construct a search query. Um, so go ahead if you would like to do so uh, as, we, as we go here. And let's try and figure out how many publications does Dimensions find in the search results that have Mark Grinstaff or Emilia Benjamin as an author, BU as an institution, and funding from the NIH. So go ahead, take a couple of minutes to work on that if you so choose. Um, after just a couple minutes, I will go ahead and kind of walk through how I would approach uh, constructing that search, and then we'll dive into kind of the second couple of topics that we'll cover today. All right, so for anyone following along um, and working on this, if you're still going, great. Just try and kind of keep working ahead of me as I start to go through how I would handle this, and then we will get back to it. <clears throat> so I'll jump back into the window. Remember, we're looking for two authors, BU and the NIH. 
Um, my first step here is going to be to add the authors. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clear with this X the entire search and go back to the default screen. Go to researcher and hit the, the more button just as before and start putting in the two names. There's one. Remember, if you click on the name, we can add a second. So I have him selected. Let's go for number two. which is showing up twice, interestingly. Um, we'll just pick the top one. Maybe an interesting example that I chose. Now that we have both names selected, we're gonna hit limit two. So now we have the or function with these two authors, which has returned an enormous number of publications. That's a pretty impressive count there. Um, we wanted funding from the NIH. Maybe it's in our list of, of uh, you know, most common ones does not look like it is. Looks like some of the more specific ones. So let's go to more. Let's just type in NIH. That's not going to do it. Um, yes, yes, it is actually. Um, so we'll hit limit there. National Institutes of Health significantly drops our publication count. And let's see if adding BU changes anything further. So to find the university, you'll go to research organization here and look at that. Boston University is the, uh, the top most common option. So we'll add limit two and take our final count from 36 down to 30. So that means six of these publications were perhaps before one or the other author was affiliated with BU, potentially as a prior faculty appointment, uh, potentially as a graduate student, um, a postdoc, something of that sort. Um, so we've taken that huge number originally and kind of found 30 publications that match the search query in the PowerPoint. So that's how you go about building a search like that, kind of finding the information you need to find, and then you can start digging around these publications for further info if that's what you needed. All right, I'm gonna jump back to the PowerPoint for just a couple slides, and then we will go back here to dimensions to see some more features. Um, so one of the kind of two powerful sets of, of tools that come from dimensions once you have searched for what you're after. So once you've narrowed down that 124 million publications to whatever your search is, whether that's for everything BU has put out, whether that's um, you know one author, two authors, a department, a subject, whatever the case may be, one place you can get a lot of interesting information is the analytic tools. Um, what this does is it just kind of gives a set of comparisons, breakdowns of, of counts, of metrics, of citations, of bibliometrics, of funding sources, all kinds, treasure trove of stuff. Um, more than I can cover in huge detail in an hour. So I'll just kind of show you some of the highlights and then you can dig around in these tools to your heart's content. Um, but it's a really kind of fine grained look. At, at some of the bibliometrics and things that you can get there. Um, these are the two views. The initial view you see is this collapsed kind of one column version. That's always on the side. You may have noticed it as I was demonstrating the search functions. Um, that gives some high level information um, that can be very useful, but is only scratching the surface. If you click the top of it to expand it, you can get much more detailed information about your search category. Um, so I'll demonstrate these in just a moment. But if you're looking for detailed citation information, detailed breakdowns, changes over time, things like that, this analytic view is most likely where you're going to find that information in dimensions. The other thing that we'll look at in just a moment here is altmetrics. I mentioned this earlier, um, and I'll, I'll kind of go through it again here before demonstrating. Altmetrics are sort of a newer approach to bibliometrics that looks to quantify and capture information beyond the standard sort of citation count, 
what journal is it published in type of thing. There's these traditional bibliometric kind of citation metrics. Those are great. Citations and journal prestige and things like that are wonderful, but there's a lot of information beyond that. Impact is a very nebulous term that can be measured in a lot of different ways that are not just how many times is it cited? What about policy documents? What about media exposure? What about geographic distribution? There's a lot of stuff there that can get captured in alt metrics. Um, dimensions includes an alt metric overview page for any item in the database that has alt metrics, um, which can be very, very handy. Um, so if you have an article and you're curious about some of these new different ways of looking at its impact or distribution, that information is there and available to you. Um, I'm highlighting it here with this image. There's a little alt metric button and a number next to it. If alt metric data exists for that item, the button will be there. And the number reflects the alt metric score. Basically, the bigger it is, the more alt metric information there is for that article. Something with a score of one or two, maybe there was one tweet about the article. Maybe it showed up in one newspaper or one popular media source. Something with a score like 10,907. Um, this is one of the highest altmetric scores that includes a BU author that we, that we have in the database, is enormously widely distributed and has been talked about, recognized, tweeted about, whatever the case may be, in a very, very, very large way. The altmetric window that you'll see is going to look like something like this. Um, this is that article that I, I just mentioned is one of BU's highest altmetric scores. And it has summaries of the different altmetric types, detailed views of different media types that have mentioned it, and geographic data about where it's being mentioned on Twitter. Um, so if you're interested in where is your work being talked about in, in, say, on Twitter, this is a really interesting way to look at that. And sometimes things, things can surprise on here. <clears throat> so... Let's go ahead and look at these in dimensions. Again, benefit to seeing demonstrations and following along beyond just listening to me talk. Um, I'm going to go ahead and clear this search again. Actually, I'm just going to take off the authors and the NIH. Um, and one thing I probably should have mentioned earlier, we're just going to look at BU as a whole right now. Um, so again, when you have one institution or person, you get this single entity kind of profile that just gives counts and things um, just for that institution. So that's kind of handy. Um, someone in the chat asked if I could double click the search box. Um, so you can kind of edit this way as well if you want to um, in the search box and use kind of keywords, things of that nature. Um, just one option, you also have the ability to search title and abstract, DOI, and advanced searching options. Um, some of this, I was intentionally kind of glossing over for the, the sake of brevity, but there are some ways in here as you play around and if you want to do more fine-grained searches as you refine your usage, there are some more options in here. Um, I am going to keep it as just BU for the moment. Um, and let's look at the analytic view first. So, like I said, we have this uh, you know, box, this kind of single column that shows us some overview, total citations, the mean citations per paper, um, a year-over-year -year look at um, citations or publications, excuse me, is currently on that graph. Um, open access quality, things like that. If we hit this arrow up here, click on analytic views, we can expand this. And this is where we start getting into that treasure trove of, of data. And like I said, we don't have time to, to go into every possible bit of this. But really, you know, I, I, I can't encourage you enough to go in here and just explore as you start using dimensions, you know, search for yourself, search for a few people in your department, your center, 
your school, college, whatever, and start looking around in here at the different information you can get. Um, this is looking at citations and different disciplines. So what disciplines are getting what number of citations? Right now, it's showing me the mean number of citations. You can change that. By hitting change, you could switch to the median if you wanted. By clicking this drop down arrow over here, you can look at different types of metrics. You can look at attention, you can look at alt metric score, you know, to see, hey, how, how much visibility are these things getting? You can look at the field weighted and relative citation ratios, um, all kinds of stuff. You can also look at these things based on different types. These are just aggregated counts. You can get bar graphs of publications in different disciplines. You can get timeline information, um, looking at different, again, this is all kind of broken down by fields of research. We can change that here if we want to use different, um, different types of filters. Um, or again, you know, changing which ones, what categories are on here. The heat map is an interesting view um, that is looking in this kind of default view at discipline on the vertical and funder on the horizontal, kind of showing where are, where are hot spots in terms of funder and discipline in terms of BU's research portfolio as a whole. Um, so all kinds of stuff. And you can go down these different tabs over here and get, again, just a treasure trove of data. Um, if we go down to, to researchers, maybe this is a common one, you're going to see people that have, this is an interesting, what are we looking at here? Ah, there we go. We're seeing generic researchers right now. Let's click show only researchers from Boston University. So we can limit it to our, our, own, our own people as it refreshes here. There we go. So now we're looking at publications for BU researchers. And again, we're getting the citations, the mean value, but you can poke around here if you want the median. If you want to change what metric you're looking at, you can do that. You can get the timelines, the heat maps. You can even get a network um, if you do enough work to, to reduce this. You have to kind of cut the, the search results down, um, you can get like a little network of co-authorship to show you collaboration and things of that nature. Um, let's look at one other one. Um, let's look at research organizations here. Um, keep in mind, everything here is related to our search. So, you know, this is not saying that Harvard has only gotten 13,000 publications compared to BU's 124,000. But of the search results, which had that 124,000 publications, of those search results, you can see, okay, Harvard showed up in almost 14,000 of those, showing there's a lot of partnership there. And you can kind of look at what other institutions, what other um, hospitals, organizations of various kinds have shown up as co-authors. And what do our, the citations on those papers mean? Um, you know, for example here, our collaborations with the University of Washington, these almost 4,000 papers have a notably higher citation rate than our papers as a whole. It's an interesting little data point. It might come down to the disciplines. It might come down to the type of things being co-written with the University of Washington. But just as an interesting thing at a first pass, that's an interesting little data point. Um, so I, I kind of apologize for the brevity with which I have to look at these analytic tools in today's webinar. But um, it really underscores that there is so much information in there. And just keep in mind that everything in the analytic tools is coming back to the body of search results you have in the main view. So everything we were just looking at has to do with this set of approximately 125,000 publications. 
<clears throat> so let's continue now and look at alt metrics. Right now, the default order is of your search results is relevance. If you want to sort by different values, again, just anywhere you see this arrow, click it and see what happens. We can search by alt metric attention score. That's that number next to the alt metric value. So let's sort by that. So let's see the big numbers here. Um, why are we not getting the ones I want? What are we doing? Um, sometimes, as I mentioned before, with um, dimensions, there is a, a bit of hiccup with your searching. Let's just start this search over and see if we can get a cleaner result. Uh, okay. Back to relevance. We're just going to start with a completely clean slate. So let's go to research organization. Boston University, we'll limit it to that. There we go. And let's look at altmetric attention score. There we go. Um, now it's showing me the things that I wanted to see. So scientific consensus on the COVID-19 pandemic, we need to act now. That is showing up as BU's highest altmetric score. 10,901 is a pretty big value. <laughs> If we click on this alt metric button, it's going to take us to that preview page in a new tab. Um, and like I said, and kind of showed you in the PowerPoint, you can get all kinds of stuff here. Right now, it says in the top 5% of all research outputs scored. So this is a top 5% value in terms of alt metric score. Over here, we have the quick kind of summary notes of where it's been mentioned, what kind of things. On this home page, we have the geographic breakdown. So we can see this article is tweeted about primarily in the US, but we can also see in the UK. It's actually gotten more tweets in the UK than it has in the US. Um, now, I don't know all the authors on this paper. I'm not an expert on this publication. It may well be that there's more UK authors on this publication than there are American authors. Could explain it right there. But that also could be an interesting note about where this article has gotten publicity. But this thing has gotten global publicity, South America, Asia, Africa, Europe, everywhere. One thing to keep in mind with the geographic breakdown is if we look down here at this bottom one, unknown. So 7,000, almost 8,000 of the tweets don't have a known geographic tie. That does kind of show you that this geographic breakdown should be taken with a grain of salt, but it doesn't entirely you know, remove the utility of, of this count and percentage showing where it's been recognized. Um, if we look at some of these other things, if you want, let's click on Twitter since we're talking about geography, you can actually see the tweets. You can go through here and look at these tweets, this place where it's been mentioned, all these things, what kind of tweets are these, what are people saying, and so on and so on. If you're interested in policy documents, you can click that tab and we can see the Scottish government, enhanced masks in schools, the European Union, the World Health Organization, another World Health Organization, um, European Union again. So like these interesting policy related items that have cited this. These don't normally show up or pop out in your traditional bibliometric approach to citations, but work that influences policy is just as impactful, just in a different way. So you can get all kinds of information here um, where it's been in the news, in blogs, all kinds of interesting stuff. It's a treasure trove, again, of resources. Back to the PowerPoint for just a moment here. Um, so if we go into the alt metrics, looked at that, 
Another question that came up both in the registration, kind of as we coast into the end here, um, is code and API access. Um, in the registration question, someone specifically asked about using um, an API to access dimensions. The question earlier that I mentioned may have had to do with coding. Um, there's good news and bad news. The good news is that Dimensions has a built-in feature that is part of our subscription as an institution to use an API to have a coded API access to pull large quantities or scrape the data as you see fit. The bad news is in our subscription, we are only allowed five API slots at a given time. And currently we do have five users that are working with those API slots. Um, so if API access to this data is something that you think would be valuable to your research, something that you think would be valuable to a project that you're working on, we would love to have people continuously working in these slots. Um, if you're interested in that, if you poke around in dimensions after today's webinar and think, yes, this information really is what I would like it to be, this has utility for my research or my project, feel free to reach out to me. Um, my email is on that slide, jpfarmer at bu.edu. Um, and please you know, reach out to me, let me know. And I've asked for a brief summary of the project and the timeline. Um, our goal is to make sure that people are getting what they need from those slots. And we kind of assess on a continuous basis um, who has them and how much utility they're getting out of them at a given time. Um, so if that's something that interests you, let me know and we will work on kind of rotating your access into one of those slots uh, for you to get the data that you need. <clears throat> um, so at this point, we've kind of covered the basic overview, the PowerPoint that I have. Um, that's This is the last of the slides. Um, if you have other questions, now is a fantastic time to throw them in the chat. If you have other things you have to do, or come up with a question that you remember later on, um, feel free to email me. Again, jpfarmer at bu.edu. I am happy to support your usage and answer your questions. Um, I can afford to get a little more in detail with a personal approach like that if there's very, very nitty gritty things you're interested in. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you will get the PowerPoint and um, recording of this. Uh, I'll email you that link in a couple days when the recording and such have been posted to the research website. I am going to go ahead and put up two more practice exercises. So if you did go ahead and make a dimensions um, kind of profile and are following along, feel free to work on those. I'll stick around. I can show you answers. I can help you with those as needed. Um, if you're going to go ahead and log off, thank you for attending. And we hope to see you at, um, at research events in the future. So I'm gonna put those up and I will see if any questions come in while people start working on those. So the question is, I understand you can enter an abstract to search for similar content. Um, I have not personally done that in Dimensions. Um, the way you would do that would be the double click on the search bar. Um, so you would go into the search in dimensions where it built the query at the top. Um, and someone asked me to double click on that that I demonstrated briefly. Um, you would go ahead and double click into that box where you could enter keywords and things like that. Um, paste the content in there or type it in however you were choosing to do so and then search based on that. Um, my usage of dimensions is largely at the institutional level, just the particulars of my day-to-day -day work typically are looking at institution level metrics, not um, searching like that. Um, so I don't have tons of tips and tricks just off the cuff um, for that sort of search. If you're running into difficulties or would like to work a little more one-on-one -on, -one on that sort of thing, again, reach out to me via email and we can, we can schedule time to kind of meet together and, and work on how to get the information you need.
once again, as people might just be working on these questions, kind of playing around in dimensions, if there's questions, please drop them in the chat. I'm happy to to kind of walk through what I can or or provide what answers I can here. So a question came in um, about where the coverage is particularly strong and where is it less strong, um, specifically referencing a researcher in the 30s um, and onward. What I can say uh, for sure with relation to this specific case is that um, dimensions generally through its acquisitions of, of the, or I should say through digital sciences acquisitions of other indexing companies and databases, tends to be fairly strong um, compared to other sources in the humanities. They've done a lot of work to make sure they have good representation of, of the humanities and, and kind of the less, uh, the, the, the disciplines that are less traditionally well indexed in these types of databases. One complaint historically has been things like SciVal don't do as good a job in like the humanities. Um, so they've tried to make themselves a real strong leader in that area. Um, the more recent things are, the more likely they are to be, to be indexed. It does go back to the 1600s. That doesn't mean it's a robust data source in the 1600s. The further back you go, there is a very, very rapid drop-off, um, in terms of the number of publications per year, um, which is, which is, kind of to be expected as we're, you're getting further and further before the digital age and things were easily indexed and stored and saved. Um, the question that came in via chat also references that there were more hits in Google Scholar than in Dimensions, which doesn't surprise me. Um, there's, you know, I can go on for, for days and I'm happy to have conversations with people individually about the details of this. Google Scholar is a tremendously valuable resource, but also a very dangerous resource in some ways. Um, Google Scholar has the largest repository of data of any of these platforms. Dimensions isn't close, SciVal isn't close, um, none of them are close in terms of pure number of items. So I'm not surprised Google Scholar finds more. The drawback with Google Scholar is it is completely unregulated. Dimensions, SciVal, these kind of managed databases do a lot of work to make sure that the data in them is quality data and is, is excluding things like predatory journals, isn't duplicated, is properly assigned to a name in an institution and those sorts of things. Um, Google Scholar does not do that. Um, Google Scholar puts that onus on the individual. So if you're making a profile for yourself in Google Scholar, it will let you go through and say, hey, this isn't my publication or you know, that sort of thing. Um, so Google Scholar in a case like this with a historic figure may give better data because it's gonna have that wider capture. Um, in cases of a more modern researcher, there's far likely or far more likely to be errors in the Google Scholar data, articles that someone did not write that are just mistakenly attributed to them. Um, predatory journals being affiliated with somebody's name, um, the duplication of items to inflate metrics. Um, it's, it's hidden down in the fine print, but Google Scholar has policies that are designed to inflate data. Um, that's why if you look up your H index on Google Scholar, it's always going to be higher than it is on SciVal. Just it, it's how they process the data. Um, so I don't want to rant too long about Google Scholar because like I said, I can go for days, but um, just different resources, different strengths. Um, and if there's specific questions about the comparison, I can, I can answer those again via email. If I diverged too far from the original question in my, my ranting, uh, please reach out to me and, and let me know if there's more specific things I can answer.
Um, another question came in about lead time on API access. Um, two parts. Uh, the second part asking about what would be required to buy additional API access. I don't know on that one. Um, I would have to get in touch with uh, our liaisons with digital science and dimensions and see what that would take. Um, I would assume anything can be done for the right price, but I don't know what the feasibility there looks like. Um, lead time is a bit a bit tricky for me to answer. Um, we haven't historically had a late, like a, a list of people waiting for API access. Um, in the past, we've been able to get people API access within a week or two of the request because we haven't had many people using it um, or we've had five people listed, but only two or three of them were active. So we could very quickly kind of boot somebody off and get the new name on. At this point, at least last I checked, we did have five at least recently active users. Um, so I don't think it would be too long of a wait. I would have to, to reach out and see if any of them were able to step, step aside immediately. So it may not be immediate. I would guess on the order of a few to several weeks would be the lead time. Um, but it will depend on how much how much interest starts to come out as we try and push dimensions into a little more visible role around campus. Again, if you're interested in that API access, please, please, please reach out to me via email. Um, we'll do everything we can to get people the access they need. So I see there's only a handful of people left. Um, if anyone is working on these exercises, uh, whoop, I just left them behind there. If anybody is working on these exercises, please let me know um, if you would like to see answers. Um, a lot of times at the end, it's a little hard for us to tell if people are actively waiting for me to show something um, or just kind of left Zoom running. Um, so if if you have questions, please put them in the chat. If you would like me to walk through these exercises, please put that in the chat. Um, so we just, so we know there's still somebody here. All right, you would like to know how to find the tweets. Let's, let's look up some tweets. Um, so this is the altmetrics question. Um, what three countries are responsible for the most tweets regarding Kevin Gallagher's paper with the highest Altmetric attention score. So I'm going to pop back over to dimensions. Uh, let's close this tab. Here we go. So I don't need Boston University anymore. We're looking for Kevin Gallagher. So we'll go to researcher. More. So we have our little search box. And start typing. There we go going to limit to Kevin Gallagher. We have publications, kind of the basic stuff here. Um, now, it's already searching by altmetric attention score, so I don't have to update that. But if you, if you hadn't had that filter set, you would click the arrow, click altmetric attention score. So the highest is this risks to global biodiversity and indigenous lands from China's overseas development finance. Cool. Altmetric score, 271. Let's click the altmetric button. And we get to this preview page. Um, just to give you an idea, 271, still in the top 5%. Our score of 10,000 and 271, both in the 5%. Um, so just to show you how high that 10,000 score was, that's a, that's a crazy high value. The Twitter demographics are on this first preview page. You don't need to click the Twitter tab. Um, if we just scroll down here, we can see the map. And then at the bottom, we have the geographic breakdown. So the most uh, tweets about this article by country come from the UK, Japan, and the US, showing some interest in those places about uh, the topic of this research. Keep in mind, 
that unknown geographic at the bottom does always kind of have to factor into the back of your mind, but that's where you'd find that information. All right, so once again, if there's anything else, kind of last minute questions or the other, other uh, uh, exercise prompt that people would like to see, please let me know here. Um, otherwise, in just a moment or two, we will go ahead and wrap things up. All right, well, I think that will conclude things for today. So thank you, anyone left for attending, and we hope to see you at research events in the future.